Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, <coughs> so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Kyle McCarter is a newly elected state senator from the 51st Illinois District. He is a small business owner who employs 15 people at two manufacturing facilities. Senator McCarter replaced Frank Watson. Senator Watson resigned his state Senate seat due to illness after a quarter century of service. Senator McCarter was appointed to that seat in February 2009 and was elected in his own right in November 2010. He is a conservative Republican who says he is fighting for fiscal responsibility, economic development, and is working to improve the business climate in Illinois. Today is his first visit with us. Senator McCarter, welcome to the conversation. So you've been doing this approximately two years. Let me just clue people in just in case. We're taping this on February the 15th, and the show will probably <laughs> air somewhere in the first part of, uh, of April. So stuff may have changed between then between now and then. Hopefully, th hopefully things have gotten better. Hopefully, right? hopefully. <laughs> but you guys are engaged in some pretty heavy lifting right about now, having yes, to do are. with the, uh, the budget and in particular uh, pension issues which are weighing heavily upon the, uh, the debt and the budget of the state of Illinois. That's correct. So I guess first I'm just going to let you say from your perspective, what do you see are the problems at the Illinois Capitol right now? Well, l let me start by saying that I, I believe there's hope for Illinois. Okay. I, I, you know, that's I, good. I, too, <laughs> too many, too, 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 too many people start with a, a list of all the problems, and they, they, they fail to leave time for what the real answers are. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to. I think people need to know that there is hope. I, I think there's a lot of people giving up today because of some some really structural problems that we've got in this government. What do you mean by giving up? Well, I, I think well, we've got we've got businesses that are that ah. have decided to leave this state right. because they have, uh, you know, we've got retirees that uh, really like it here, but they're they are, they're making a decision over coffee in the morning because of the decisions, the policy decisions that legislators are making. They're they're deciding at the breakfast table whether they're going to stay here and retire here, and you know the unfortunate thing is, we we break we break we 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 force wonderful people out of our communities. I mean, I, I got an email from uh, this morning from a gentleman who, uh, in fact, one of the, the, the articles you, you referred to me, he, he had sent that article to me. Well, he's already gone. He lives in Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, that family was taken out of my church community, out of my local community, their kids. We, you know, we, we, we miss out on having them here. So some, uh, we've got to do something because we can't afford to lose these folks. Now, they are taxpayers, but they're our friends as well. So uh, we've got to address some very structural uh, uh, problems. Uh, Let me just tell you about an experience <laughs> that I had. Yes. Actually, um, uh, my wife and I, were, we were on a, uh, an extended trip out to the desert southwest uh, l last fall uh, in October. And we were uh, in and out of Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona. But while we were in Utah, we found a lot of refugees from California. Okay. People who, got business guys, business guys who sold out everything. They didn't want to be in California anymore, and they have now gone to Utah where the business climate is a lot friendlier, right. and they have set up business <clears throat> there, and they're hoping and praying to God, honestly, that the federal government doesn't say, oh, well, poor California is going bankrupt. Let's take money from Utah and give it to California, in the same way that Missouri and other states right. around Illinois are saying the same thing about Illinois and those around California, those around Michigan. Well, you know, an entitlement mentality is a, is, is a plague in a way because it even go, it even has moved itself to uh, state legislators and thinking that the, the stimulus money that came mm -hmm. might just come again mm -hmm. and, and, and relieve them of the responsibility of making the tough decisions. This reminds me of that blonde joke that says, <laughs> the, the, the blonde who said, I can't be out of money, I still have checks. <laughs> well, and that's right? a, very similar. And, 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 and you're talking about <clears throat> elected officials that's who right. seem to think this very same way. I can't be out of money because I can still write a check. 
Well, and let's let's be very candid here. You have a lot of folks that have been elected based on the programs that they have either delivered or promised to their constituents. And at this point, we've got to say no. And you know, as I always relate back to the parent-child relationship. You know, sometimes you can't tell your kids yes all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a lot of times when you're cutting back in a family and you're doing, when you're living within your means, which is what we're asking Springfield to do, you make decisions as to, you know, how many channels you're going to have, how many times you're going to go out to eat, and, uh, you know, how long a vacation you're going to take. And you don't like telling your kids, kids, you know, we're just going to do a little less this time. But that's what you do because you're responsible. And your kids learn from it. You know what? I think the citizens of this state would be super impressed by a legislature that says, listen, this is all we can do. We love you. We care for you. But because we care for you and we care for the long-term uh, healthiness of this state, we're going to make some tough decisions today to say no to some programs. Well, what are you going to do when you're in your office in Springfield and then outside are a bunch of... Uh uh, people from public service unions carrying signs and yelling and screaming that hey 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 we're we're entitled to keep what you promised us. I I don't I don't just uh, represent and serve people that are in public service unions. I, I represent everyone, mm -hmm. and they are one group only. And uh, this this government doesn't exist to give them a job. This government exists to serve the people of Illinois. Now, they are one component of it, and you, they, it, it doesn't matter what they demand. We can only give them what we can really afford. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wonder if folks who work for government understand that when they start telling people they want more, that what they're saying to some mom is, um, uh, I, I want you to give my kids new shoes instead of your own kids new shoes. Well, and, and true, you know, I think, and, and we're right in the middle of this right now with the budget. And, and I'll tell you, I think a budget says a lot of things. A, a budget talks about your policies. It talks about who you care for and who, you, who, you, who you're going to really protect. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's in numbers, but it, it means something. And I think we need a budget that, that respects the poor, but at the same time respects those who create the wealth to provide for the poor. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's that's a that's a difficult balance. But you know we don't. I don't think too many uh, the people that I know uh, get up every day and, and tell our kids I long for you to be on public aid. I can't wait till you get your first link card. We don't say that to our kids. We want our kids to be to have a job, to be self sufficient, and be in a position to even help other people. I would like people to be more like you. You. At the beginning, when I was uh, introducing you, I said that you're, you own two businesses, at least, yes. and you have these 15 employees and a manufacturer. Right. In other words, you've learned to make money on your own. Why don't the public schools teach children how to do that? I mean, that's not something well, you learn in public I think school. There, th no, but I think there's a few that are uh, starting to get involved in some entrepreneurial uh, projects. Well, we need uh, more I, than I, a few. I, I've seen, I've seen uh, probably uh, a few more in some of the private schools. But I think, no, I think it, that needs to be taught. And, and, and I think you, you show people an appreciation for hard work and, and really the gifts that are in within them to create wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a bad thing because it, uh, as, as long as you know what to do with it. And I think one of, the, one of my objectives is to make as much money as I can, to save as much money as I can, and give as much money as I can away. And I think that was an old, that was a John Wesley, uh, you know, uh, adage. But, uh, you know, I, I think we got to show our kids that, yeah, you've got the ability to do some great things, but you got to be responsible. And I think, uh, you know, I, I came from, I, I started with nothing. I had a five. I, I worked uh, worked hard. Made I had a five thousand dollar commission check. Uh, went to the, went to the bank and got a small loan on my name. Just in fact, uh, right down the road from here. And uh, you know, my wife and I just kept working hard every year and putting everything, saving, putting everything back into this business. And and it's uh, it's done well. And we're uh, now in a position to help some other, you know, help some people. Well, that's my point. Is that many of the people who. Um, who don't see their way clear in this world, that are depending on someone else like you to give them a job, are, are 
built into that whole dependent idea, whether they're depending upon an employer to mm -hmm. give them a job, in other words, to put food on the table, or they're expecting you as a state senator to give them money out of other people's uh, paychecks so that they can put food on their table. Yeah, we, you know, like I said, this, this entitlement mentality is a very dangerous thing. So coming back, let's, uh, you know, here's, there's the philosophy. Now let's get down to nuts and bolts. You, I as a state senator and the entire legislature, have problems in dealing with a budget which is completely out of control in the state of Illinois. Not something that just happened yesterday, not something that happened in the last five years. This has been coming on for quite a few years, long before the collapse of the economy. Only people didn't realize it. Even now, um, I have uh, this, this article here. This is from today's Wall Street Journal, that the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, February 15th, in which it says that uh, Illinois union allies turn critic, and they're referring to Mr. Madigan, who has been the leader of the House of Representatives for long, 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 long time. I think he's been it since 82, with the exception <laughs> yeah. of a couple of years when Republicans had control right. of, the, uh, of the House of Representatives in Illinois. And if this guy, who is a strong supporter of labor, has now changed his mind, uh, what, what is that saying about uh, the temperature in Illinois? Well, we, we've gotten to the point now that we, we like again, we've got to make these tough decisions. And if you can't, if you, you can't keep making promises to people that you can't keep. And, uh, and that's really what's happened. We, we've said, yeah, you know, a lot of folks who have supported the, the, public, the, the public service unions, they said, yeah, we love you, vote for us, elect us. Well, now we, we can't deliver mm -hmm. on those promises. No, they can't deliver, well, those the, that made the promises. Those that made the promises, right. Well, and I say, I say we when I talk about the legislature, and I know I didn't make them, and I know I, wasn't, I would not have voted for these kinds of budgets, but I feel responsible. Well, you're part of the institution. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm elected, so I've, I've, got to, I've got to take responsibility for where we're at, right, right. Where we're at right now. But if you, don't, if you don't address these major cost drivers in this budget, like pensions, like health care, like the, the runaway entitlements, I mean, if you don't address those major cost drivers, you'll never get it un in, under control. You won't fix this budget by printing on both sides of the copy paper. And you know, and buying fewer paper clips. I mean, that those are not the solutions. The solutions are to address the major cost drivers. Mm -hmm. Pensions are going to be a, a, a real uh, something that we've got to address uh, sooner than later because uh, we're 103 billion underfunded in our pensions today. Say that number again. 103 now? Billion, billion dollars. And that's just one state. That's one state. That's we're right. About. And, and that's so a lot of money. It is. And uh, we, we've got Everett to be Dirksen, who used to be a senator, a U.S. senator in the state, used to have a saying. It was something like a billion here, a billion there, and then it really adds up to real money. And yeah. that was in the days when a billion dollars was a whole lot of That's money. That's right. And now you're saying that the state of Illinois is now a hundred billion in. That's correct. That used to be the whole federal government. Right. Yeah, that's and, and and so we've got we've got to give some uh, we've got to make some tough decisions. And we're okay, have to so you're these in pensions. the minority, right? Yes. I mean, the Republicans really do not have any uh, say um, in the Senate or in the House, right? Well, we have a say, just not enough. Well, to, you don't have you don't have a voting things. majority. I right. always say I get I have one right. vote no matter what. Correct. But, uh, so, uh, considering your position. What are your colleagues on the other side of the aisle willing to do to save the state? Uh, I don't know. I think I think the plan that they've got right now is not uh, not going to take us there. I mean, the plan we've What's got right now, now that's to borrow 8.75 billion dollars more. Mm -hmm. And remember, we passed the largest one of the largest tax increases in the state, mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 we've we've caused, as I said originally, a lot of people to decide to leave this state. So we're not going to get their revenue, mm -hmm. but that was supposed to pay the bills. The tax increase was supposed to ta pay the bills and catch us up and make everything right. Now, the part of the governor's plan is to borrow $8.7 billion more. It's not a restructuring of debt, as has been alluded to. Restructuring of debt means that you change the interest rates and you keep the same amount. This is completely new debt. And what this will do for us at the, in, in five years will put us at a deficit of over $18 billion. None of the money on that, none of the, the payments on that $8.75 is due in the next four years. Now what happens in the next four years? 
What happens in four years? Don't you want things to look really good then? Because that's when the new governor will be elected. All those payments are right after the four years. And we're, we're in, it's a bad plan. It's not good for the people. There is a way, though, to uh, put forth a budget that could put us in, in, have surpluses at the end of five years. Okay, and you've put this plan forward, or someone in, uh, has put this plan forward? Uh, I am I am going to be, my the Republican uh, Senate uh, representative will be putting forth a plan, and, I, and, and I, I'll just say that I, I have been the one developing that. Uh, just, I think one of it is, you know, I, I'm an accountant in, in business, and it, it, it comes a little easier for me than some of the other guys, but uh, we're going to put together something that's fair, responsible, and puts us in the uh, position of surpluses. Now, it will address pensions, and it will be some, some, a little uncomfortable for some folks. Mm -hmm. uh, it will address health care. That, too, will be challenging. Uh, we will reduce spending. Uh, at, and, and live within our means, but at the same time, we're looking to revenues by way of workers' comp reform and uh, some other reforms, uh, Medicaid reform, which we've already implemented. We have about a, that's, we expect over a, uh, a billion dollars of savings in the next four years on that. The, those words, that word reform is code. It's a shortcut for saying a much, much longer sentence or group of sentences. When you say worker compensation reform, what would this look like at the end of the day compared to what it is today? Well, the only, the major tenant to talk about is primary cause. Accidents uh, to, to qualify for a claim within the workers' compensation uh, structure. The accident. Uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the workplace must be the, be the primary cause of the accident. And you think about it, it's workers' compensation. Surely all those accidents are at the workplace, not in Illinois, and they don't have to be. One little portion of that, that, that accident uh, could be related in the workplace, and all of that money is paid within the workplace. So primary causation is key. It's the only thing that'll drop the rates down. Our rates right now are three times that of Indiana, two times that of Missouri, and the key difference is primary causation. Uh, this is, unfortunately, this has become jackpot justice. Look at the Menard situation. We've got, we've got uh, corrections officers, even, even the warden making claims of carpal tunnel for turning keys. Uh, you know, this, this, is, this is a system that has got to change quickly because that's one of the costs of doing business that's running uh, employers uh, out of the state. Mm -hmm. Why is it that, uh, I mean, I have here another article. This, this particular article here is a uh, guest editorial in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, but it actually was written by the State Journal Register, which is an, um, a Springfield, Illinois yes. newspaper. My real question to you is how come the, uh, the media seems so unfavorable to uh, Illinois Republicans? I don't see, I mean, in here, this article, which I'm not going to read right now, does not seem very friendly to the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, pension um, reform. Uh, it does quote here from the, uh, from the Constitution of the state mm -hmm. of Illinois. It says, uh, membership in any pension or retirement system of the state in a unit of local government or school district or any agency or instrumentality thereof shall be an enforceable contractual relationship, the benefit of which shall not be diminished or impaired. And then they go on to say, well, you can't. I mean, th there's the Constitution. You can't uh, undo stuff. And, right. But over here <laughs> in, this, in this Wall Street Journal article, I see that uh, State Senate President John Cullerton, a man I don't know, I guess you do, uh, has said he believes such a law, and they're talking about pension reform, would be unconstitutional, but would be allowed to come up for a vote. Well, so when I read that, I'm like, first of all, it's unconstitutional, but we'll still vote on it when all of you guys the first thing you do is you take an oath to uphold the basic law of the state of Illinois, which is the Constitution. Well, if, if, listen, if, if, uh, if the President Cullerton wants the Republicans to be the bad guys in this yes. and to be the ones that vote for a pension reform that passes and does... And well, it can't and, without and it Democrats. Is, that is constitutional. Yeah. And, and he doesn't want to be one of those Democrats that votes for that. That's fine with me. 
I mean, it's, it's time to step up and be the mature one here and do what it, need, it has to be done. So you I, have I, a plan to do this I, under right. a constitutional Right. I, I ask people, process. do you want a modified pension or a bankrupt one? Which one would be best for your future? I think a modified pension program. And I think, uh, accord, and, and there's, a, there's a plan put forth by the uh, Civic Committee of Chicago, and that is this. You, you, you ask people, if you want all these benefits that have been promised to you that we can't afford, you're going to have to put more in the pot to pay for those. Now, that is still constitutional. Asking people to pay more doesn't violate the Constitution. The next option they have is to go to the, tour, the second tier, which we passed just last year, which says anyone as of January this one this year is in a new set of benefits, one that's one more reasonable, one we can afford. You can go to the <coughs> second tier. The third thing you can do is you can go to a 401k style We'll, pay, we'll give you the money, everything that you've accumulated up to now. Mm -hmm. We won't penalize you, but we'll take that and we'll put that in a 401k to where you're responsible and, uh, and you, can be a, you can be a part of uh, planning for your retirement. Like the private sector does. Mm -hmm. like, like I've done for many years until I got in this position, and I still do. Uh, you know, I think that is a reasonable plan that addresses the constitutionality at least it, it, gives, it gives us the, the ability to keep our word with people and pay them what we said we were going to pay them. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's a satisfactory answer right there. <laughs> that at least you have some sort of a plan that's workable that isn't, well, it's not constitutional, but we're going to vote on it anyways. No, I, th I think you've got to step up. These, these are tough decisions, but we've got we've to we've gotta gather up the courage to make them because it's just not going to go away. Uh, this pension problem is, you know, m m miraculously is not going to go from $103 billion underfunded uh, just because the economy might get better. Uh, let's face it, this, we've, we've gone through the same recession, state government has, as your family, my family, my small business, my church group, our schools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all made the tough changes to live within our means. We've done what it took. Mm -hmm. The only institution among the whole state that didn't change was state government. For two years we've been blaming other people and saying, well, it'll get better, it'll go away, I'll keep promising you I'll pay you a pension that I can't afford, I'll keep promising you programs that we can't afford, uh, because I want to get, you know, people say that, I think, because they just want to get reelected. Mm -hmm. But it's time now that the final institution in this state learned to live within its means. Let me ask you this. I mean, you, the state has made obligations to education, okay? Right. Uh, they promised to put a certain amount of money above and beyond property ta local property taxes into right. school districts. It's a promise that they've made over the years. There are school districts right around your area, including in your area, but also I know for a fact, because he's been a guest here, and that would be uh, Ed Hightower, who is right. the uh, uh, superintendent of schools for the Edwardsville school system, who sat here and told me that he still hasn't got money for last year's schools, and now you know we're into this year. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're making cuts. I forget how much he said. I think he cut like five million last year, and they're cutting another five million right. out of their budget this year. I believe those are the numbers. And by the way, we're down to five minutes right now. So yeah. let's just briefly say, what is it that the state's going to do about the education system in the state of Illinois? Can you afford the education system that has been currently designed? Well, let me first say, I, th I believe the, the bills to the schools have been paid for the previous year. Are they still in arrears? Yes, they are. There's more money that we owe them. I, I, I disagreed with the governor's decision to add a 3% increase to the foundation level to our schools mm -hmm. last year. That was just wrong. You, we, we should have been more honest with these people and said, listen, in the next two, three, four years, this is what we're going to be able to afford. That may have been 3% less. That may have been 5% less. But at least we could have kept our word as to paying them on time. And because these schools have lost a lot of money by not being able to plan because we waited till May, June, and then we passed half the budget. Then we waited to pass the other half of the budget. They have lost a lot of money by not being able to tell their teachers whether they're going to have a position. They've, they've, they've had to wait on programs and decide whether they're going to be able to you know, carry through with them. Uh, we have cost these schools a lot of money by not being upfront 
and, and, uh, and, and honest with them from the start. We should have told them two years ago, listen, this is a bad situation. This is all we're able to do, but we're going to keep our word and pay you on time. Okay. I'm sure that uh, Dr. Hightower would appreciate hearing something like and that. And he's heard that directly from me as well. Good. <laughs> and there are other, uh, what other districts are in, in, in your Senate that hit, that's not in, in your Senate? Right. Well, the, uh, the Decatur area is the northern part of my district, uh, all the way down to O'Fallon. And, uh, you know, you like, live in St. Saint Clair County? I live County? in St. Clair County. Okay. Yes. And how many counties are in your district? Nine counties in my district. It's, uh, so it's mostly rural. Though. 162 miles north to south and only 11 miles wide in some places. How many people are in that district approximately? Uh, you know? I would estimate just over 300,000. Uh huh. Right. So, all right. So you've got 300,000 people spread over nine, nine counties and a little narrow corridor who you're responsible for. Um, you like the job? I, I mean, do. I, I, you, I tell, you, you got a head start. This, this is the know, best job coming in in February yeah, of 09. This is the best job I've ever had. I, I, I say, you know, 10 years ago, this may not have been the right job for me, even five years ago. You know, you go through a lot of things in life, even, even some tragedies, even some real hardships. Mm -hmm. But I think they make you and, and make you the person that you need to be for that time in your life. And I think uh, I think now I've come to the Senate with some some world, some experience in life that uh, allows me to to make decisions that are best for everyone, all mm -hmm. all people, and uh, and I'm really uh, honored to be able to be in a position to speak on the people's behalf. That's uh, uh, that you know you're lucky. You're lucky. I'm yeah. very there, there there are there are only a few people throughout Illinois' history who've had the opportunity that that you have right yes. now, and uh, I hope that you, you and your colleagues will make the most of this over over the next couple of years and not get diverted into. Uh, uh, talks about well, shall we shall we legalize marijuana or decriminalize <laughs> marijuana? <laughs> How can we even have these kind of discussions when the the very fate of the financial fate of the state is uh, is in the balance? All right. Well, I, I uh, like I said, I feel honored to be in this position, and I'm going to do everything I can to put put this state uh, back on tra uh, track to a, uh, their, its fiscal healthiness. Is there anything we haven't covered here? Because we still have another minute or so to go. Uh, no, we got about 30 seconds to go. <laughs> anything anything uh, that you wanted to well, talk I, about? Well, I think I, I, I should make it real clear. It's, it's important that people uh, are very tenaciously stay in contact with their legislators. And, and with technology today, there's no excuse not to let your representatives know how you feel via email, telephone, whatever it is. Are you a Twitter guy? Uh, I am a Twitter guy and I'm a Facebook guy. Uh, it's Senator McCarter. You can go to Facebook and I actually post votes that happen within seconds on my Facebook and I think people appreciate it and I explain why I voted yes or no. Mm -hmm. And do you get a lot of feedback? I do. Lots of, lots of good feedback. Great. Thank you so much well, for thank being you with for us. Having I really me. enjoyed you for, you know, this is our first visit and I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you thank for thank the you opportunity for being with, with you. And to, to the audience, I've been speaking with uh, State Senator Kyle McCarter. Uh, he represents uh, a district uh, which is a little bit east of what would be normally considered Metro East by you St. Louisans. Um, uh, well, you heard the conversation. He had some very interesting things to say. Illinois has really got some serious problems and hopefully they're going to get this under control. To my regular audience, we'll see you next Monday. Thanks for visiting with us. Goodbye.